Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Ayşe Süberkar. It was a close relationship that dated back centuries, but in 2013 it took a turn for the worse. That year, Egypt saw its first democratically elected president overthrown in a coup. Turkey, which was a strong supporter of Egypt's fledgling government and its president, Mohamed Morsi, condemned the military takeover. Since then, mistrust between Ankara and Cairo has only grown, from taking opposing sides in the conflict in Libya to competition for vast energy reserves in the eastern Mediterranean, how this relationship fares will be crucial in determining the future of the region. Let's take a look at this report. And joining me now from Doha, Omar Ashur, who is the founding chair of the Security Studies Program at Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, and Murat Aslan, who is an assistant professor at Hassan Kalyonju University. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So, Murat, is there an imminent risk of a military escalation between Egypt and Turkey-backed GNA forces? If you review the latest developments in Libya, I think, yes, it's probable, because uh, we see that Sisi is very eager to have Haftar to reign at the east of Libya for various reasons. And also GNA is very keen to reach to the Egyptian border to have a united Libya. Once they don't agree, compromise, that means there will be a confrontation and we should expect it. But the issue is to what extent they can further their aim and a probable military intervention in terms of sustainability and also future scenarios, not only in Libya, but also in Egypt and Eastern Mediterranean Sea. All right. Sisi actually has recently got together with the tribal leaders and he explained and spoke about his country's red lines. Let's listen to what he had to say. The red lines that we have announced are primarily a call for peace and to end the conflict in Libya. But we will not stand idle in the face of any moves that pose a direct threat to the national strategic security on our western borders, especially during increased military mobilization around the city of Sirte. So, Ötmerş, why all of a sudden Sirte? has become Egypt's red line, because we know it's 800 kilometers away from the Egyptian border. What's at stake for Cairo? It's really perplexing in, in so many ways. Uh, I think the, the best way to explain it is to see how uh, it's the regime's interest, the regi ruling regime in Cairo's interest, versus the national interest of Egypt. Uh, on one end, um, as you said, it's, uh, it's actually it's about over 900 kilometers away from the uh, from Saloum, between Saloum and Sirte. Uh, from Saloum to the other end of Egypt, Rafah in Sinai, northeast Sinai, where he pretty much lost control against uh, a group of insurgents, which are you know outnumbered completely 100 to one. Um, from from again from from Saloum to Rafah, it's over it's less than 900 kilometers. Saddam Hussein, when he tried to take Kuwait, only 200 kilometers, the whole length of it, you know, there was a whole international coalition against him. 
So now he's trying. What what uh, um, um, Sisi is trying to do is to take five times. Um, you know uh, what what Saddam tried to do in 1991. Mm-hmm. Similar reasons. There is the oil wealth in uh, Ras Lanouf and others. But Saddam actually had some capacity to do it because back then he had like uh, one of the, the fourth largest army in the world and it had some experience in fighting. <laughs> I don't see, you know, that posturing. There's an escalation in the rhetoric. He chose a group of, I, I would say, loyalists. Nobody uh, recognized them as, uh, you know, full tribal leaders. They're mainly clan leaders. Mm-hmm. leaders of some of the families and some of the clans within larger tribes. Most of the members of these tribes are fighting on the other side in Tripoli, and many of them denounce them. So he's trying to form his, uh, a group of uh, basically loyalists to the regime, not even to, to the Egyptian you know, national interest, but to the mm-hmm. regime in Cairo. Yes. Uh, with uh, w- w- with a, a vast, vast extension all the way to Sirte, which is, you know, if this is not going to end into a tragedy, it will be laughable. So, Murat, you know, but it, it actually, it's actually a reality on the ground. Yes. Yeah, so, Murat, is the Egyptian army a match for the uh, uh, Turkish forces? And do you see, are there any political obstacles before an all-out operation by Egypt? In such cases, uh, there must be a balance between conventionality and unconventionality. Uh, the traditional and conventional forces like Egyptian army are usually uh, short of engaging with irregularities in such cases. So if Egyptian army enters to the Libyan territory and holds a portion of it, that means this army must be prepared for a long-term struggle and also, uh, you know, a kind of conflict of new type. Up until now, Western states, Russia or other Arabic states, preferred uh, a kind of proxy war, either in Syria or in Libya. So Egyptian intervention means proxy war will be surpassed and we will have a regular army struggling yes. with deficit. So, Omar, how does it fit in an international law for a so-called um, Eastern Parliament calling for a direct uh, foreign intervention to oust an internationally recognized government. And also, we also know that Sisi and Macron in their latest phone call have, call, have reported they agreed on stopping all illegal interventions in Libya. What's your take on that? I think, one, the, the, uh, that, uh, uh, the, the, the tenure of that parliament expired a, a while ago, a lot of years ago, actually. Uh, it's not exactly the parliament. It's a group of again loyalist MPs who uh, whose legitimacy expired a few uh, a few years ago, and uh, they're basically calling for a for direct foreign intervention, which I agree with uh, with Murat. It will involve some conventionality. The problem is uh, e- Egypt's record in both conventional warfare and uh, counterinsurgency warfare is mediocre. Uh, mm-hmm. Egypt did not win one war in the last century till now. So since the campaign against Sudan in 1899, which was led by the Brits, basically, and involved some Egyptian soldiers, that's the last one they won. They won against the Mahdist movements, who were basically fighting with swords and, and bows. Uh, from 1948 to 56 to 67 to 73 to 91 against the Iraqis, uh, the Americans won the war, but the battles fought by Egypt, they showed they reflected very, very limited capacities in terms of uh, conventional warfare. All right, all right. Uh, I, I have to I have to interrupt you here because I'm running out of time. I want to ask this to Murat. How could tensions between Turkey and Egypt affect both countries' ties with the United States? I think the U.S. attitude is decisive in Libya's case. Up until now, the U.S. strategy was active neutrality. That means they were just observing and acting pending to the developments. And they preferred a kind of balance between legitimacy and illegitimacy. What I mean is that they consulted with Tripoli, and at the meantime, they sent another delegation to Haftar. Mm-hmm. But uh, starting from the last week, the U.S. attitude has been changing. Yes. Uh, what I mean is that they are more or less together with Tripoli rather than Haftar. And uh, this is a challenge for Egyptian intervention because Egyptian intervention will be a clear challenge to the United States, along with 
uh, Russian presence because Egypt will also legitimize Russian bases at the east of Libya. So I don't think that the United States will favor such an intervention that Russia will be involved. Okay. So, um, Omar, would Egypt favor a divided Libya? Yes, that's uh, unfortunately the case. Well, I, I wouldn't say Egypt. I would say mainly the Sisi regime because it's uh, unaccountable to the rest of Egypt. Uh, but uh, in this case, it, they would prefer a divided Libya, an eastern Libya, where they can install somebody like the Sisi regime, uh, so Hefter, a military dictatorship, basically, that can more or less provide them with, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the in prevent first the, the, uh, a democratic Libya from being successful, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, try to manipulate a bit the the, uh, the oil wealth in Rutland Open, the areas around it, and basically the oil crescent areas. Uh, and c keep a buffer from uh, any, let's say, freedom and democracy that will develop in the West, if it's ever developed. Um, but uh, obviously there are competitors. If he try to do that, we have Russia on the ground, who will basically be the, the, the main player, given the different sizes. Uh, but also you have the UAE, which also would, uh, would like to see uh, a major cut. And it's the main, um, basically it, it, it will be between the UAE, the money, and Russia, the, the you know, conventional hybrid power, uh, international power. Yes. Um, so this may not even work for him. Like, it, it, it's perplexing again, because if you saw, uh, you know, the maritime uh, boundary treaty between, uh, between Turkey and Libya, uh, the Egyptian national interests actually lie there, because it will give them more uh, uh, boundaries, extended boundaries in the, in yes. the, in the Mediterranean. So, all well. And the Sukhairat agreement, again, backed by Turkey and backed by the UN, uh, will de-escalate the situation in Libya. It may end up in a democratic Libya, which will, is not so good for the Sisi regime. But, but again, the national interest overall on the long term is with a secure, de-escalated free Libya with a big uh, chunk of the, uh, a larger portion of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean wealth going okay. to Egypt. All right. Uh, but, but that's not the regime's interest. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, Sorry. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. 46 years ago, Turkey launched an operation to protect the Turkish minority in Cyprus. Since then, the island has remained divided along ethnic lines with an uneasy peace. Talks for a lasting solution have been ongoing for decades, but regional rivalries have often scuttered any progress. It all happened on the morning of July the 20th, 1974, when Turkey launched a peace operation to push back a Greece-backed military coup. 40,000 troops were deployed to ensure the safety of Turkish Cypriots from radical Greek Cypriot nationalists who wanted to see the island united with Greece. In the years leading up to Turkey's intervention, 30,000 Turkish Cypriots were forced to flee their homes and dozens of villages were destroyed. In 1983, as Greek Cypriots continued to claim their sovereign right over the entire island, Turkish Cypriots formed the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. While Turkish Cypriots voted overwhelmingly in favor of unification in a 2004 referendum, 75% of Greek Cypriots opposed the move. The same year, despite rejecting reunification, Greek-administered Cyprus was granted EU membership. And today, after countless failed peace talks, the resource-rich Mediterranean island remains divided. And to discuss what's at stake, joining me now is Ata Atun, who is a professor at Cyprus Science University based in Girne in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. He is also a veteran of the peace operation of 1974. And Mehmet Öcü, who is a former Turkish diplomat. So, gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Ata, what has led Turkey's peace operation 46 years ago? Could you walk us through the circumstances of that time and of the uh, political environment on the island. The chain of the events that set the stage for Turkey-Cyprus peace operation in 1974 has its roots in the mid-50s when EOKA, the notorious Greek Cypriot terror organization seeking Enosis, the annexation of island in favor of Greece, started oppressing and killing local Turkish Cypriots. 
EOKA terrorists sought the removal of Turkish Cypriots to remove parts of the island in what can only be described as ethnic cleansing. The terror group's brutal violence forced Turkish Cypriots of last of least 33 mixed villages to abandon their homes from 55, 1955 to 1955 <coughs> to 1958. Ankara and Athens came to terms on February 11, 1959, with the approval of the United Kingdom, as well as leaders of the island's conflicting communities. The Zurich and London agreement paved the way for independence, intercommunal harmony, and societal autonomy with yes. Turkey. But what was, the, what was the last straw that pushed Turkey to launch this uh, peace operation? What was the diplomatic uh, environment back then? Actually, the tipping point, the tipping point of the Cyprus crisis and the peace operation, it came on July 15, 1974, when the then president of Cyprus, Makarios, was ousted by the ultra-nationalist and anti-Turkish Nikos Samson, one of the leaders of the EOKA B, a Greek Cypriot paramilitary organization formed in 1971. Yes. After the coup organized by the colonial junta of Greece, the self-appointed president Nikos Samson declared the establishment of the Hellenic Republic of Cyprus on July 16 and the abolition of the Republic of Cyprus officially yes. on July 18. Self-appointed President Nikos Samson stated the annexation of the Hellenic Republic of Cyprus to Greece. This is totally, this is totally against the Constitution of Cyprus, All right. Republic of Cyprus. So then the uh, peace operation was launched uh, in 1974. Mehmet, what exactly. kind of difficulties Turkey had to face after this uh, peace operation, how the international community reacted and how the embargoes which came later impacted Turkish economy as well as its fight against terrorist organizations? Well, you remember that 1974, we are at the peak of the Cold War era. Mm -hmm. So United States is allies and the Soviet Union. It wasn't like today, multipolar world. Therefore, uh, even the Greek Cypriots admitted that Turkish operation in 1974 was legitimate. It was in response to the EOK uh, coup uh, attempt mm -hmm. against uh, Makarios. And therefore, uh, I think there was a general understanding of what Turkey did. Because concern derived mostly from the United States especially, uh, that Makarios, you remember, joined movement of non-aligned countries at that time. Also, it was flirting with the Soviet Union, arch enemy of NATO. Therefore, initially, I think if you look at the Kissinger's uh, memoirs, you will see that there was a lukewarm reaction to the Turkish intervention there. Also, British were the co-guarantor together with Greece and Turkey. They also somehow implicitly uh, uh, confirmed that the Turkish operation was legal mm -hmm. under the Zurich Agreement. But we suffered some, I think, uh, implications of that, like sanctions coming from the United States, uh, arms sales. Also, European Economic Community at that time, EEC, imposed some sort of sanctions against Turkey, freezing the accession talks. It wasn't as effective as it could be today, of course. And the Soviet Union has not made, made much uh, grunges and noises about that. And uh, But overall... I think the Turkish operation was seen more or less in a positive light mm -hmm. because of the Soviet threat, because of the non-aligned movement drift of Makarios, because of the illegal NOC's objective to unite the island with Greece under uh, the Zuri agreement. This wasn't uh, permissible. Uh -huh. So overall, I think it was an operation uh, which created international reaction, but not as grave and strong as one could expect. All right. So but we are still living with the consequences of non-solution, of course. Exactly. So, Ata, just a few months ago, a Byzantine flag was hung uh, on the Tuzla Mosque in Larnaca, and a historic Köprülü Hacı İbrahim Mosque in Limassol was attacked. How prevalent is this 
an uh, animosity among the Greek Cypriots towards the Turks on the island. And do these incidents have anything to do with the latest strange relations between Turkey and Greece, in your opinion? The governments of Turkey and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus condemned the hanging of Byzantine flag over a mosque in Greek Cyprus. The Greek administration should stop encouraging anti-Turkish and anti-Islamic activities that are being fanned by some dark forces in the south of the island and should take measures to put an end to this diseased mentality. Actually, it's keep going on since 1963, which we doesn't approve. Those who promote Islamophia, Islamophia will soon face the troubles caused by the fascists they protect. Mm -hmm. Turkey Cypriots condemned the hanging of a Byzantine flag on the wall of the Tuzla Mosque in Larnaca after a petrol bomb was thrown into the courtyard of the Kökülü Hacı İbrahim Yes, Aa, but I, I want to learn how prevalent is this animosity among the Greek Cypriots towards the Turks. Briefly, please. Actually, actually, these incidents have definitely has something to do with the latest tensions between Turkey and Greece. The Greek Cypriot administration jointly with Greece trying to occupy illegally yes. the exclusive economic zone of Turkey in Eastern Mediterranean and trying to trying to uh, imprison Turkey to the shores of the Turkish uh, Turkish uh, shores in mm -hmm. the Aegean Sea and the and the Mediterranean Sea. I think this was the the agreement between Libya and the Turkey actually dissolved all this all this um, um, all these wishes of the Greece and um, Greek Cypriots and this act is against to the to the agreement of Libya and the Turkey uh, just to protest it. Yeah, so uh, Mehmet, the South unilaterally declared exclusive economic zone with Egypt, Israel and Jordan in 2003 and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus granted licenses to Turkish Petroleum for drilling in 2011. But now things are heating up as Turkey presses ahead with its uh, drilling, uh, drilling activities. How feasible do you think are these energy projects um, um, without Turkey's inclusion? Well, I mean, from whatever angle you look at it, Turkey is the largest power in Eastmet to reckon. Not only that we have the longest border to Eastmet, but we also have quite uh, ambitious objectives in the Eastmet in terms of uh, exploration, seismics, and also uh, opening through Libya agreement to the greater Middle East and the uh, Gibraltar all the way. And the rights of TRNC are also somehow protected by Turkey because Greek Cypriots are not recognizing their rights, equal rights, uh, to the resources in the Eastman. So without Turkey as a solution finder or spoiler of any deal in Eastman, I don't think that any solution is possible. And today, I don't think we are talking much about the energy resource because there's abundance of it. There are difficulties of getting this uh, oil and gas uh, uh, to the surface and selling to the international markets, which are oversupplied. Mm -hmm. so today, I think the main issue that we are discussing is about the exclusive economic zone, continental zones, and, uh, you know, of the islands and uh, TRNC. Therefore, the issue is not only a legal issue, it's also a political issue and equity issue, mm -hmm. equitable solution that we are discussing. On Cyprus, when you ask uh, Atabe, I want to make just two comments about it. One is that the real... Uh, source of the problem, root source of the problem in Cyprus is the Greek Cypriots not recognizing the equality of Turkish Cypriots. They want to see them, you know, downgraded to a minority level. This is not going to work, of course. They are two equal communities. The second important issue, which will make Cyprus problem to be resolved quite difficult, is the new generation both on size of the on both sides of the island, they don't have any tradition of knowing each other, interacting with one another, like the generation before us. They lived together, coexisted. But now, new generation, both on the Turkish side and the Greek Cypriot side, they don't know each other. There is so much animosity coming from the Greek Cypriot side because this generation doesn't know 
what really happened before 1974. They think that Turks just came and invaded the island. Yes. To get out of our territories. This is their logic. Therefore, I think there is a lot of effort needed to be breaking this. And I don't believe that there is any solution in the foreseeable future that we will come to discuss perhaps on that issue. Oh, all right, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. I appreciate it a lot. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subakash. If you've got any comments, do share them with us on Twitter with the hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.